Welcome and thanks everyone for joining our webinar, Maternal Patient Safety, the Joint Commission Makes It a Priority. A little disclaimer, so this presentation includes information from the Joint Commission and other sources that are designated on the slides. Um, the following studies are not conducted by Perigen. To ask a question during the webinar, you just enter your question into the chat box located in the GoToWebinar panel on the right side of your screen. Um, I think it's fun to go ahead and try this. I'd love to see where everyone's calling in from. Um, so if you want to go ahead and type the state that you're calling in from into the question box. Um, Dr. Alana McGalrick, she's calling in from California. Um, KK, who's presenting with us, is calling in from Florida. And I'm here in our headquarters in Cary, North Carolina. Wow, it looks like there are people from all over. Hershey, Pennsylvania, Danville, New York, Illinois, Wisconsin. Miami, Kentucky, South Carolina, Nebraska, Georgia, Iowa, St. Louis, Missouri, Sacramento, Oregon, all coming in, that's great. We're happy to have you guys. So a recording will be available following the webinar. Um, in addition, the resources mentioned in the presentation will be available for download. So at the very end of the webinar, I'll provide instructions uh, for how to download this. So a little, about a, a little bit about our host, Perigen. So Perigen has provided innovative software solutions for over 20 years with the mission of protecting all moms and babies. Um, we're really excited about the large enrollment for this webinar. It really demonstrates the passion we all share for maternal safety. Our registration includes a wide variety of roles across the industry, including acute care clinicians, healthcare risk managers, quality collaborative leaders, and colleagues in the fetal monitoring arena, arena like GE, OBIC, Phillips, and Cerner. And we're happy to have you and love that we can all work together to promote safety for all moms and babies. Um, Perigen offers an automated early warning system called PeriWatch Vigilance, and this works with any existing electronic fetal monitoring software to quickly and consistently identify patients who may be developing a potentially worsening condition. This artificial intelligence software solution can be used to help standardize clinical interpretation within your unit and across any healthcare enterprise. Used as an early warning system, it can help clinicians and providers intervene sooner, potentially improving outcomes for moms and babies. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter. So today we have um, Dr. Alana McGalrick. She's the Chief Nursing Officer here at Perigen. Um, with significant perinatal experience, Dr. McGalrick leads Perigen's efforts to expand and enhance clinical training, customer outcomes reporting, and publishing. And we also have KK, Karen Kalega. Uh, she's a clinical consultant here at Perigen, and she's a clinical subject matter expert for Perigen's obstetrical software. Her expertise in obstetric practices, regulations, and hospital operations improves prospective cost engagement, adoption, and implementation. And so now I will turn it over to Dr. Elena McGalrick um, for the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Lexi. Welcome everyone and thank you for joining today's discussion on the new Joint Commission Accreditation Manual additions. We will spend a few minutes per element of performance to highlight ways to meet the new additions and the references available for your review. This PowerPoint will be made available at the end of the presentation. So this current slide lists our learning objectives for today. These objectives have been developed in order to guide our learning discussion, and we hope that you will be able to evaluate our program based on these objectives. So some current background information on this subject. According to McDermott et al, 2016, 40 to 50% of all maternal deaths are potentially preventable. That statistic is frightening to admit that despite access to the world's leading healthcare, the United States has not made a significant impact on obstetric patient safety. The near doubling of the national maternal severe morbidity rates has led to government leaders to demand immediate action. 
The research has shown that most preventable maternal events are preceded by changes in vital signs. Unfortunately, clinicians' failure to appreciate the patient's worsening condition has been a major contributor to the rising maternal morbidity and mortality rates. According to the CDC, most recent data, the United States is experiencing a rise in the pregnancy-related mortality rate, which in 2013 was recorded at 17.3 deaths per 100,000 live births. We are currently failing to meet the Healthy People 2020 maternal mortality rate goal, which was set at 11.2. If we continue to remain idle, our patients will remain at risk of severe injury or demise. All right, and now we're going to launch our first question. So the poll question will show up right on your screen. Are you currently participating in a local, state, or national maternal safety collaborative? Go ahead and just answer on your screen. Yes, no, unsure, or plan to participate. Give everyone a few seconds to answer. A few more seconds. Great, and it looks like majority are. And our next poll question, if yes, which collaborative are you partnering with? All right, and about 10 more seconds to answer. All right, and I'll share the results for that. So 24% part of AIM, 11% CMQCC, 13% with A1, 43% state-specific collaborative, and the rest are others. And I'll turn it back over to Dr. McGough. Elena? My apologies, I was on mute so that I didn't interrupt the poll questions. Significant contributing factors have led to the rising national maternal morbidity and mortality rates, including the changing medical complexity of the obstetric patient. Our patients are diagnosed with complex comorbidities associated with pregnancy, thus negatively impacting maternal fetal well-being. The pathophysiology of these leading comorbidities, diabetes, hypertension, obesity, and cardiac disease, are greatly underappreciated. We have been unable to agree on the best approach to managing the maternal patient. This includes simple oxytocin checklists to more complex disease processes, such as preeclampsia. And finally, limited research exists related to maternal early warning systems despite success with the adult non-pregnant patient population. Unfortunately, clinical experts in the maternal field, the maternal fetal medicine, have been unable to reach consensus on physiological parameter thresholds. This has led to a variety of treatment protocols that vary across the country. The CDC reported that current leading causes of pregnancy-related death in the United States include cardiovascular disease, infection, and maternal hemorrhage. It is important that the interventions are impactful and that are built upon a solid foundation of compliance. Obstetric safety strategies must be multidisciplinary and supported by the healthcare organization in order to be successful. So we can address preventable maternal fetal deaths by dissecting the problem into two parts. Part A, people causative factors. These include inaccurate assessments, interpretation errors, and delay in communication of patient status. Part B involves the process causative factors, lack of standardization, delay in escalation of care, and individual patient complex comorbidities. 
Unfortunately, the consequences of an error along either of these pathways can be quite serious. These have led to complicated delivery scenarios, emergent rescue of the fetus, and increased risk of maternal and newborn morbidity and mortality. This leads us to our next poll question. So have you experienced an adverse outcome that was related to any of the following causative factors? And you can check all that apply. Oh, might have shared that one too soon. Turning it back over to you, Elena. Okay. All right, so now for the fun stuff. The Joint Commission has added um, some new elements of performance for us um, to be surveyed on. So effective July 2020, the Joint Commission will be serving 13 new elements of performance. All accredited hospitals will be required to show evidence of compliance with these new standards designed to address safe maternal care. Housed within the provision of care, treatment, and services chapter, the Joint Commission determined that focusing on early recognition and timely treatment of maternal hemorrhage and severe hypertension and preeclampsia would have the most impact on current maternal morbidity and mortality rates. So the following information will provide an overview of each of the elements of performance, a resource to achieve compliance, and in most cases, a sample template. So maternal hemorrhage is the leading cause of death worldwide, and it's a significant contributing factor to severe maternal complications during hospitalization. The literature indicates that that we are also experiencing racial disparities with regards to obstetric hemorrhage rates. Black maternal patients are two to three times more likely to die of hemorrhage than white women, despite not being considered at higher risk for blood loss during delivery. Secrets et al. 2019 determined that 74% of the maternal hemorrhage cases in California were evaluated as a good chance or strong chance of being preventable. Causes of adverse obstetric hemorrhage events include missed or inaccurately communicated signs and symptoms of active blood loss, underestimation of blood loss, and lack of standardized approach to responding to a rapid blood loss case. The elements of performance are designed to address these causative factors. So I provided just a brief uh, one uh, statement per element of performance for you to have as a reference. Uh, in your um, packet that you will be able to download, um, I have put the elements of performance into a Word document for you with a column to add your notes or um, evidence of compliance when you survey whether or not you are already um, in compliance or, uh, you know, you have a gap that you need to address um, per element that has been listed in the most recent publication. I want to note that um, the element of performance number two which is uh, written procedures for stage-based maternal hemorrhage management. I did put an asterisk there to remind everybody that this is the largest element of performance, um, and I believe requiring the most work at the hospital um, or healthcare organizational level. I'm going to review these superficially, um, but please spend time reviewing um, the patient care standards published by the Joint Commission because it will itemize each um, requirement that um, they will be looking for, especially for number two, because it does say a written policy and procedure, but within that, you know, I'll, I'll try and go through as much as I can, but there's a lot of information um, that they have covered under that element of performance number two. So the element of performance number one under the obstetric um, uh, hemorrhage was complete an assessment using an evidence-based tool for determining maternal hemorrhage risk upon admission to labor and delivery, and upon admission to postpartum. Um, I have uh, been fortunate enough to um, have most of my nursing career here in California and, um, and uh, live within the, uh, the CMQCC uh, area. So we um, use the CMQCC toolkits um, as often as possible. Um, and certainly my familiarity with this one, when, when it was released, we implemented it at my previous um, uh, role uh, within that healthcare organization, and 
embedded in this toolkit is, is the risk assessment that you can have built either on paper um, or right into your EMR. Um, quite simple. Uh, they just need to build those. I say that's quite simple, but I'm not technical. So, you know, to build those, those fields for you. Um, certainly assessing and discussing, discussing the patient's risks for hemorrhage allow the team to identify those patients that may be considered at higher risk and you can be prepared for in anticipation of an emergent event if it should, should occur. The risk of hemorrhage may change during the patient's stay depending on their clinical situation. And this uh, toolkit was published in 2015. It is free. You just need to register at the site to download it. And it provides a comprehensive obstetric risk assessment um, that can easily be added um, to your current documentation system. So the element of performance too, as I previously mentioned, it is the largest um, element. I'm not going to read through each. Um, again, you will have that available to you and I'm sure you've already printed it. But the first statement is to develop a written evidence-based procedure for stage-based management of pregnant and postpartum patients who experience maternal hemorrhage. That include the following, um, an evidence-based tool for an algorithm for identification and treatment, um, the use of evidence-based set of emergency response medications, which we'll go through, required response team, man manage, um, team members, how the team will respond, the procedures that are activated, blood bank response, guidance on when to consult additional experts, how to communicate with your patients and family members during an event, and then criteria for team debrief. I will review some of these um, um, pieces of element of performance number two because they are called out separately. But know that most of these are housed within your massive transfusion protocol. And if you don't have a massive transfusion protocol, perhaps it exists in your OB hemorrhage protocol. Um, but the recommendation would be that you have a housewide MTP uh, policy and procedure. So evidence-based policies, of course, are designed to guide clinical practice. And multidisciplinary policy and procedures are integral to ensuring clinicians provide safe quality care to the hospitalized patient. Policies provide staff with a standardized approach to care interventions to minimize care delays and foster effective communication amongst team members. These are two policy, these are, this is one a policy example. I did include an OB hemorrhage policy example in the toolkit that include the minimum requirements listed under element of performance number two. So um, keep in mind that you need to describe your med kit, the team members' roles and responsibilities, um, your massive transfusion protocol needs to know how to call the blood bank, um, make sure that you uh, walk through your, your massive transfusion protocol. Um, there have been instances where security needs to be involved to either hold the elevators so that the blood bank and or your runner, designated runners can get from um, the blood bank uh, to your unit, um, depending on how many floors up, how many floors down, et cetera, that the labor and delivery unit um, and the women's OR may be located. Um, consider what happens on Sunday night when no one is around. You know, that O200 example when you are on, um, you know, have skeletal staff throughout the house, make sure that you involve them in any of your uh, mock drills that you perform so that they are also aware of how to perform, um, certainly under duress in an emergent situation like this. And then um, how much blood is required and how much blood should be on site. Those are all um, components of the element of performance. Number two, so make sure that that is all spelled out in your policy. Also include your consults and transfers to a higher level of care. Um, if you're at a critical access hospital or a facility that may not have access to um, everything that's required in an MTP, you need to um, have it written out how you will access um, uh, different levels of consult and how you will make your transfers. Also, the last um, thing is to make sure you have scripted how to communicate during your to your patient and um, family members during um, an active blood loss event. Um, they get lost and forgotten, and sometimes um, that is uh, very crucial to make sure that they are kept informed. So um, my recommendation is that it is scripted. Uh, they also call out for team debriefs, but we're going to cover that um, separately um, in another slide. So element of performance number three uh, requires that each unit has a standardized, secure, dedicated hemorrhage supply kit that at a minimum contains the following emergency hemorrhage supplies as determined by the organization. And again, um, you know, I, I continue to include the reference to the CMQCC toolkit. Um, it has the uh, recommended um, 
hemorrhage cart uh, supply list and also a medication bag list. And um, I do have an, uh, a, a tackle box as a picture um, just to give a visual, but most have moved to the uh, crash cart um, uh, template. So you can use a crash cart that's designated as your hemorrhage cart. Um, and make sure that that has um, all the items that uh, are listed in CMQCC and anything else that your healthcare organization and your delivering clinicians um, prefer to have on board. Um, there are several options for the cart, uh, and I'm not going to recommend any vendors, but just remember um, they need to be checked with the same frequency as we do our crash carts, and that they're locked in secured areas, and um, you know when the next uh, item is to expire, et cetera. Other points to consider, how many do you need? Uh, you look at your geographical location of your unit. Certainly one would be on labor and delivery. Do you need one on a postpartum because it's on a separate floor? Um, is it located between the two units? Do you have two based on your the high risk uh, nature of your patient population? Um, do you have an overflow unit? Do you need one in the ER because um, you tend to have a lot of admits through um, the patient, uh, um, patients through the ER? Element of performance number four is to provide role-specific education to all staff and providers who treat pregnant and postpartum patients about the organization's hemorrhage procedure. So they do give at a minimum, of course, education occurs at orientation, and then if anything changes, and, um, and then finally every two years. So for the care team to function optimally in a true emergency, it is essential that all members know the procedures that they should follow in the event of a hemorrhage. Morton et al. 2019 identified that clinical readiness was an improvement opportunity that would make an impressionable impact on maternal outcomes. The role of the obstetric RN is complex without a pure ability to measure nursing impact on patient care at the bedside, so we can only prepare our staff to rely on a solid found, uh, knowledge base to support critical thinking while making important patient care decisions. A nursing competency is a suitable tool to measure patient care standards applied at the bedside. The tool can be used to assess the RN and other, and provide other insight to clinician knowledge base, care plans, plans, assessment skills, and application of the appropriate care at the bedside. So element of performance uh, number five refers to conducting drills at least annually to determine if system issues are present. As with competencies, clinical readiness also requires staff to respond in critical emergency situations. Simulation of these events is a valuable tool that can address many opportunities to improve staff response during emergent situations and improve staff recognition of patients' worsening condition. Multidisciplinary drills give an organization the opportunity to practice and identify system issues in order to determine proficiency. And so we provided a couple of different um, uh, templates for you to, to review and to adapt at, at the hospital level. So element of performance number six, and we're still under obstetric, uh, obstetric hemorrhage, review hemorrhage cases that meet criteria established by the organization to evaluate the effectiveness of care, treatment, and services provided by the hemorrhage response team during the event. A standardized approach to assessment of maternal cases is an invaluable tool to gather key information that could potentially improve future patient experiences. While a number of methods exist, it is important that an organization um, have a multidisciplinary approach to address process gaps to reduce the maternal morbidity and mortality rates. National efforts have recently focused on identifying pregnant and postpartum women who experience admission to the ICU or receive four or more units of blood. And this is from Callahan in two, et al. in 2014. They state that these two criteria were chosen because of the highest specificity and sensitivity to maternal adverse outcomes. And an important consideration during case review is that not all cases will reveal substandard care. Sometimes they will have been, care would have been optimal. Most importantly, we need to carefully to, to be careful to remember that the information gathered during these sessions will be useful when identifying data related to what is considered optimal care standards. Kilpatrick et al. 2014 recommended the minimum standards that will assist with conducting a maternal review process, and those are listed on the template that will, um, that will be provided. So finally, element of performance number seven is patient and family education. And the 
the element of performance states that provide education to patients and their families. Um, at a minimum, education should include signs and symptoms of postpartum hemorrhage during hospitalization and when to seek care, and then signs and symptoms that alert the patient to seek immediate care. The research indicates that discharge education suffers from alarming inconsistencies, misinformation, and subjective bias. Supley et al. 2016 found that many misconceptions existed amongst postpartum nursing staff within the same organization. Survey respondents were unable to list the top three leading causes of maternal death, signs and symptoms of hypertension disorder, or describe the pathophysiology of complex comorbidities. Additional survey responses were afraid to scare their patients with terms such as death or life-threatening. Others described bleeding analogies with clot sizes and food. These inconsistencies have led to patients being misinformed, undereducated, and unappreciative of their high-risk medical condition. Cephaly et al. in 2016 determined that a standardized tool would provide a consistent standard approach to making discharge education a priority. This tool presented here has been widely accepted as an appropriate checklist and handout for the postpartum patient. So hypertension, crisis, and preeclampsia. Preeclampsia is defined as a rapidly progressive disorder that is characterized by high blood pressure and most often in the presence of proteinuria. It is not uncommon for maternal patients to present without the popular signs and symptoms like edema, sudden weight gain, headaches, and visual disturbances. These patients are often overlooked, placing the maternal fetal patient at great risk. It is estimated that preeclampsia can incur, occur in 5 to 8% of all pregnancies and are responsible for 76,000 maternal and 500,000 infant deaths each year. And these are, this information can be found quite easily on the Preeclampsia Foundation from 2019. The ACOG Practice Bulletin 202, which was published in February 2019, provides the guidelines for diagnosis and management of gestational hypertension and preeclampsia. The practice bulletin includes definitions and diagnostic criteria for hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. Therapy recommendations are featured in the practice bulletin, including initiation of prophylactic treatment with aspirin between 12 and 28 weeks of gestation, first-line hypertensive medications, and seizure prevention. As with the obstetric hemorrhage um, standards, the elements of performance here for hypertension and pre hypertensive disorders and preeclampsia are listed on the slide. And again, I want to point um, your attention to element of performance number two, uh, it being the largest and, and containing the most work for you, the policy and procedure for managing maternal patients with severe hypertension and preeclampsia. So element of performance number one was develop written evidence-based procedures for measuring and remeasuring blood pressure. This procedure must include criteria that identify patients with severely elevated blood pressure. It seems like a simple skill that many of us mastered our first few weeks in nursing school. Unfortunately, it's being done incorrectly. Following these steps will lead to more accurate blood pressure assessment interpretation of data that is extremely valuable to diagnosing a patient who may be suffering from hypertension disorder or preeclampsia. This tool can be found with the preeclampsia toolkit for CMQCC. Procedures should address appropriate blood pressure measurement, including cuff size, proper patient positioning, and frequency of measurement. Inaccurate measurement can lead to a mother not receiving proper treatment and being discharged with elevated blood pressure. So element of performance two, which is develop a written based, evidence-based procedure for managing pregnant and postpartum patients with severe hypertension and preeclampsia, must include the following. Evidence-based set of emergency response medications that are stocked and immediately available on the obstetric unit. The use of seizure prophylaxis. Guidance on when to consult additional experts and consider transfer to a higher level of care. Guidance on when to use continuous fetal monitoring. Got in someone to consider emergent delivery and criteria for when the team is debrief is required. So we provide an example of a, um, a severe hypertension uh, preeclampsia policy um, with the guidelines associated with ACOG. We just wanted to make sure that you um, had a template to work from if you don't already have one. I felt like I couldn't go much further um, without taking a few moments to address magnesium sulfate. Um, 
when we speak of hypertension and preeclampsia in order to have a complete packet for our staff as far as education um, and our policy and procedure associated with hypertensive patients is to address MAG. You know, MAG is, has two, oh, MAG has two main goals, which is the management of preeclampsia and prevention of seizures. Um, and, and that is why we provide that to our patients. So while preparing our nurses to care for a preeclamptic patient, we must make sure that they are competent in um, administering magnesium sulfate. Here's an example of the magnesium um, sulfate competency, which will be available um, at the conclusion of the presentation. We will also provide a performance checklist and a sample policy um, for you to use as reference um, to compare to yours. Um, it's imperative that staff receive adequate education um, regarding magnesium due to its high-risk medication label. In understanding the pathophysiology of eclampsia, the rationale for MAG as seizure prevention and the risk of cerebral events is critical to the care of our at-risk patients. So that's why it's included here today. And we also provided a um, competency for um, hypertensive disorders. Again, these must look familiar because they are the mock drill uh, templates that we uh, I showed in the obstetric component. So nothing has changed. Um, you just uh, go ahead and select which drill you're running and um, you can add those to your mock drill template. What is different is the case review for the preeclamptic patient. Again, this can be found in the toolkit um, provided by CMQCC. And this is the um, team debriefing form for uh, severe hypertension and preeclampsia. Um, this is specific to uh, that type of pathophysiology and the response to um, a patient diagnosed with um, either of these. Patient and family education, as this covers obstetric uh, hemorrhage, it also covers um, uh, life-threatening hypertension and preeclamptic uh, situations for our discharge patients. And one thing to note is that when we were discussing how to approach patient and family education to be in compliance um, with this element of performance, it was really nice to actually find um, and disseminate the, the research that's been done by Sepley et al. Um, in 2016, but also that, you know, be creative at the hospital level or within your healthcare organization. Um, we've seen t-shirts with uh, got headache, um, magnets with um, that are drops of blood that you can provide in the discharge packets um, so that they know, uh, you know, active bright red bleeding, they can put it on their fridge and, and be reminded. I'm sure if, um, you know, if your own experience, if when you had a baby, um, when did you read your discharge instructions? I personally read mine about six months after. Um, so though being a uh, perinatal nurse in labor and delivery, uh, I didn't read my discharge instructions. So um, we have to make that consideration with our patients. You can also look at using badge holders, stethoscope clips, um, maybe get uh, something that you can put on your whiteboards. I know those are getting busy enough as it is, um, but anything that might draw the attention to the patient and the family that these are high risk um, situations that, that they need to be aware of. And with that, I'm gonna pass it back over to Lexi for the demo. Thanks, Alana. I'm gonna pass it over to KK, Karen Kalega, and she's gonna run us through a quick tray watch vigilance demonstration. Hey, this is Karen. Can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Super. Um, so I want to thank you all so much for joining us today. I know we have a, a big group together that's fantastic. And I wanted to start with a big thank you to Alana for the robust presentation and for providing so many useful tools. I'm going to present a very brief overview of the Perigen Vigilance Solution. For those of you that may be interested in discussing this further with a team member, there's a question just after this demo that you can complete. There are some things I wanna lay out before I get into the demo. Vigilance is an early warning system, it is not a documentation system. 
What it does is pull data from your fetal monitor and the EMR. It aggregates and analyzes that data and gives it back to you with actual notifications and information. The goal is to give you, the nurse, timely notifications of potentially worsening conditions so you can assess the patient and intervene as appropriate and potentially avoid a delay in care. Our system functions as a quality improvement tool. It does not send in information back to the permanent medical record. And we are proud to say that Perigen products have been used for greater than a million deliveries. So we're gonna jump into the demo. This is the multi-patient view. Let me just play with my columns a little bit here. Um, you see on the left-hand side here, you have patient information. This is the ADT information about the patient. Here you have clinical information on patient age, the gestational age, gravidum parity. This is all gonna feed in from what you have already documented in the medical record. Um, and then you have these columns. You have PER, you have vital signs, and you have cues. These are the vigilance early warning tools with orange visual notifications. Orange in our system means that a parameter of some sort has been breached and you, or you've like exceeded a limit. This board also does give you a filtering ability. If I click on this filter right here, you see that at this time, I have three hospitals showing on this board. I can just click and just show that one hospital. So I can filter by hospital. I also have the ability to filter by patient. So let's say right now I have every patient that is on the board showing. What I wanna do is limit it to those that are just breaching parameters or those that are quote orange because what that does is then just show us those that have something concerning going on and really allows us to allocate our assets and attention to that so if i do that i'm going to click and everything that's not orange is going to go away so all i have to do if i want a single patient view is one click on this screen i'm going to click on this patient and I get to a single patient view. You have four panels on this view. This top panel is our pattern recognition. Um, I'm gonna show you if you, I'm gonna just move over here because I wanna show you some accelerations. If I hover over this finding, it's gonna give me more information about that finding. You see I'm on an acceleration, it's green, so it is color coded, green, happy, go. If I hover over variables, I get more information. Variables and earlies are yellow. And then as we move to more concerning elements in a tracing, I don't know that I have any right now, they would be brown. So late, prolongs, and variables that break the what we call 60 by 60 rule would turn brown because there's more implications for fetal acid base status. This pattern recognition has been validated by the NIH. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we have a supporting article that's available on our website. The NIH had a fetal monitoring experts evaluate tracings and then ran those tracings through our analysis tool. The result was substantial agreement with the experts. If you hover over contractions, you do get more information about that finding also. And also, if you are using internal monitors, the system will calculate MVUs for you. If you were tracing multiples, you would have tabs up here so that you would have the ability to independently view each of those babies. And then over to the right here, you have a summary of the tracing over the past 30 minutes. Importantly, if there is anything, let me see if I can bring this away. Um, if, if there was anything concerning in the tracing, you have an orange icon here to tell you which of the parameters has been breached. Um, let's talk a little bit more about those parameters. If I click here and go to the algorithm, what I can do, I'm displaying is um, an oxytocin checklist. The, and we know that oxytocin checklists are one of the tools that help bring standardization to the bedside. This is the Perigen automated oxytocin checklist. It is running in the background 24 7 from the moment you have the patient on the monitor. It does not get tired, it doesn't need rest, it is always going when a patient is being monitored. The elements of our algorithm are on average over 30 minutes. 
So if we have a mean baseline variability, less than six beats per minute, and there's no 15 by 15 A cells, it's going to turn orange. If we have late decelerations greater than or equal to two during that half hour, it's going to turn orange. If we have, this is combinations of decelerations and, sorry, I don't know why this is, there we go. If we, and then this one right here is uterine tachycystole. I know the number feels a little funny to us, but if you take the NIH definition and you extrapolate from 10 minutes to 30, a count of 16 and 30 minutes is going to turn orange. So you will turn orange for uterine tachycystole. Another wonderful um, tool that's available is, um, I showed you here, we have the pattern net recognition that is color coded. All I have to do is one click and you can see, I'm gonna make all that pattern recognition go away. And so it's no longer there. Um, I can tell you that has been a huge satisfier for our partners as a teaching and education tool. It really helps to build confidence that, especially you know, with your um, newer staff, that they actually are getting it. You bring it back and yes, I was right. It is indeed a variable. The next element is our trend view. So you have either a four hour or a 12 hour trend view. The 12 hour is purposeful because we know nurses function in 12 hours. It's a great tool for your SBAR handoff report. These areas here in orange indicate that during those timeframes, one of those parameters has been breached. We're hovering right over here and we can see it's contractions. She's in a state of uterine tachycystole and contracting too often. This magnifier allows me to trend through hours of tracing quite easily. If I just drag it, you can see the area that I'm hovering over is, display, is displayed large in this top panel. <coughs> Um, I can tell you this ease of navigation through hours and hours of tracing is another satisfier with our product. Um, medical care providers love the ability to, that as long as the patient's been on the monitor, they can just keep trending through and easily see what's been going on with this patient. This section is your vital signs. It shows trended vital signs. All you have to do is hover over any of the findings to get more information about that last set of signs. This set, is, this set here was the last set that was taken. And again, in vigilance, orange is to get your attention. So you've breached a parameter, let's go and assess, see if we need some intervention, potentially call a care provider and try and improve the situation and prevent a worsening outcome. The last element, the last panel is the, the labor curve. Um, I'm gonna go more go here, if we can get a better view. I'm gonna choose another patient, see if I can get a good view of the curve. So this patient's this labor curve is not Friedman's, it's not Zhang's curve either, because our curve takes into account physiological factors. For example, patient's gestational age, are they a primip or a multip? What's the fetal position? Do they have an epidural in place? And how often are they contracting? It gives you a percentage of where she is falling on the curve. You see this area of yellow is our zone of normal. This dotted line is our 50th percentile, and then this dark line is our patient's progress. It updates every time the nurse puts in an exam, and if I hover, I can see the findings from that exam. Importantly, it gives me information. It gives me a message. So there's always a curve message up here in the upper right. It, this time it says the dilatation pattern is within expected range. If I hover, okay, I. I'm sorry, there's, there's three levels of messaging. So dilatation pattern is within expected range. This pattern shows a lack of progress, or, or, and that would be early warning. That would turn orange um, to let us know that this patient is slowing. And the reason we do an orange before they actually fall off the curve is because this is an early warning system. The idea is always to give you timely notifications so that you can assess the patient, do the expected interventions, 
in this situation, she's slowed. So we wanna do what we can to progress this labor and support a vaginal birth. If we're not successful, you will get to she is in the dystocia zone or fallen off the curve. One other thing that's um, a great feature here is let's say this patient delivers. We can collapse each of these sections that are associated to an intrapartum period and simply have our trended vital signs showing. And again, if you hover, you can see more about the finding. If you were to be breaching parameters of any sort, it would turn, it would have an orange icon here to draw your attention. Um, because as Alana pointed out during the presentation, most preventable events are preceded by vital sign changes. So it's always great to have that notification. We need a little bit of more attention here. Um, lastly, it's important that you know that both the multi-patient view and this single patient view are available on remote platforms, so they can be, review they can be viewed remotely. So um, I thank you again for joining us today, and I'm going to hand this back over to Lexi. Thank you, KK. Get my screen back up here. And we only have a few minutes left, but I just want to want to pull question. Do you feel that the tools and references presented today will be helpful with achieving compliance with the new elements of performance? And again, at the um, end of this presentation, I'll give instructions on how to get those. I want a few seconds to answer. Great, and over 90% said yes. Great. Um, and I'll turn this over to Elena for the summary. Okay, and um, so there were a couple of questions, I think a total of three questions that came through during the presentation, and I had that part of the webinar turned off because I can't watch that and, and um, speak at the same time. Um, it's way too distracting. So the first question was, do you foresee the CMQCC protocol to be updated since ACOG is now saying 1,000 milliliters blood loss? Um, um, uh, regardless of the uh, mode of delivery. And yes, uh, they don't have anything posted on their website um, that saying that there's a new toolkit coming, but I know that the collaborative is active. So uh, my assumption would be, and we all know how assuming gets you into trouble, but that um, that they will either make a statement, uh, a revision statement, or there will be a revised toolkit coming out to reflect the new um, new blood loss standard. Number two, will hospitals that don't have obstetric pediatrics but do have ED be expected to meet all of the elements of performance under PC06.01.01? Um, now, um, the ED is called out under a number of the elements of performance um, because they do see uh, postpartum patients and, and some, you know, uh, labor and delivery patients, um, despite the fact that you may not have an OB unit. So it does call out the emergency department. It says um, they do list it under certain elements of performance. Um, emergency department is often where patients with symptoms or signs of severe hypertension or hemorrhage present for care after delivery. For this reason, education should be provided to staff and providers in emergency departments, regardless of the hospital's ability to provide labor and delivery services. So um, yes, the ED needs to be addressed as far as um, anticipating um, and being ready for um, those types of patients. And number three, the post-birth form is great for meeting EP7 for post dispatch for do you have examples of education for patients during hospitalization? And um, so that would have been my error. I was um, going quickly uh, through our slides, but the Supply et al. article, which was published in the, um, the Nursing for Women's Health Journal, um, that that tool actually can be embedded within your EMR, um, and you can use it ongoing. They actually do make those recommendations within their article that discharge education, of course, starts with inpatient education. So um, it can be adapted for and used in your current care plan or um, in your EMR 
or if you're still on paper, documentation form. So I don't have a separate form that covers what needs to be included in your EMR, but within the document itself, it says, please, you know, embed this in your EMR if that is your process. So I hope that answers um, that question. It's and and we provide the reference, so it's a fantastic article. And it, you know, um, if you're a member, then then you're good to go because it's um, free. Okay. So I'll just continue. Um, to, so to summarize, obviously we need to express some outrage at our national M um, and M rates. We know that when we go in to take care of our patients, our goal is to give good care. Um, you know, uh, and and not have adverse outcomes occur with our patients. So. Um, I'm very pro uh, obstetric care. Um, for those of you that know me personally know this, this has been a passion of mine for a very long time. Um, and I do believe that collectively we can make the difference. Um, experiencing a maternal injury or loss is, is so devastating um, for any clinician, either indirectly or directly involved. Um, and we all know that we don't want our future patients to be placed in these vulnerable positions. And I feel like as a nation, um, we we might be um, we might be putting those patients at risk. So my uh, I propose to you why wait until 2020? Um, be proactive. Um, use the gap analysis that we're providing to to make your necessary changes now. Even if it means you just go back out and get your team together to look at your MTP or you know is your kit in the right place? You know do you have an, uh, enough obstetric uh, uh, OB hemorrhage kits? Um, available to your staff. Do the wheels work? Has it been dusted? Um, those sort of things. Take a look at it. Um, and then if you have already addressed these new standards and you were very proactive and things were done in, um, before this even came out as surveyable, share your tools and experiences with your colleagues. We don't need to recreate anything. I mean, a competency is a competency. Um, a performance checklist, a mock drill, you know, these scenarios, we will post these for you, but it, it's very easy. If you've written a drill, Hand it to your friend at the next facility, even, even if you're not within the same healthcare organization. Um, we're all working towards the same goal. Um, and this is the only way I think that we can make sure that practice is changing, um, and certainly for the better. All right, I think um, my last statement for you, and I know that um, Lexi's going to close it up, but at the end of the presentation, Lexi's gonna provide some instructions on how to access the resources um, that I've referenced. And then of course the reference list will be there. Um, it's very extensive, uh, but I think I've highlighted the areas that you need to address, certainly with um, those articles that we, we used specifically um, to address the elements of performance here today. So thank you very much for attending. Um, super excited to see uh, what happens next year for M&M rates. Lexi. Thanks so much, Alana. And just before I go to the resources, just want to launch one last poll question. Um, and while you're answering this, if you have any last minute questions that you want to chat in for our presenters, you can do that now or um, feel free to respond to our follow up email and let us know um, if we can provide any other resources for you. Give it a few more seconds. To answer the poll question. See if there's any other questions that come in. Great, thank you. Um, so as far as the resources, so after um, the webinar, we will download the recording and as well as a PDF of the presentation. And then all of the resources that were referenced during the presentation, we're going to put those together for you um, into a readable format um, that you will be able to download um, from our follow-up email. So please look out for that. If you don't receive that um, within the next two days or so, um, please reach out to us or um, it'll be posted on our website after our December 10th webinar. So we will be repeating this webinar um, on December 10th. So if you have any colleagues that you'd love to join or anyone else you want to share it with, um, please do. We're thankful for everyone who signed up um, to make it so we had to have another webinar. Um, we appreciate that as well as your feedback. So when you close the webinar today, a survey will appear. Please let us know. Um, if there's any other topics you want covered in future webinars, as well as um, how we did today. Um, and that'll also be in the follow-up email. 
And the very last slide is references are available on request and they'll also be in that in that resource kit. So so thank you.